Hey everybody, it's Brian at Summit Racing here and I am with Al Noe and we are here to discuss this really cool thing that we just did which was taking our Tesla Model 3 project car and taking it down to the standing mile which is pretty much all <laughs> Do you want to tell us about you know how you conceived of doing this whole thing? Yeah, yeah. So so the idea kind of originated with uh, actually just talking about what different things are we going to do with the Tesla, and that is one of our goals is to race it in a bunch of different ways. But more importantly than racing it, because anybody could have trailered it down there and raced it, we were silly enough or stupid enough, depending on how you want to say it, to drive the vehicle about sixteen hundred miles round trip and learn about what are the Teslas like, where do you charge it, how long does it take to charge, how much is it per mile for a big road trip like that, and what types of things do we not yet know about EVs that we really should know. And then also a bit of a comparison to the internal combustion stuff that, that I am passionate about and love. Brian, you as well, because you've, you've actually land speed raced a Z06 Corvette, so you've got familiarity with the uh, the group that uh, used to run the Ohio Mile. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted to go to Arkansas, uh, work with the great people at ECTA, experience the event, and then also the road trip was really a big part of it as well. So uh, mission accomplished, we went down there, we, we looked at the class records for the EV. Uh, we set two different class records at the uh, half mile, one mile, and two kilometer. So there are six records now in the name of Summit Racing, which is awesome. And uh, by the way, we encourage any EV owners to go to an ECTA meet and beat our records because records are always meant to be broken. Somebody out there should always try to be faster than you. And that's what makes racing great. Uh, we had a great opportunity to go down and set the records, but now you have a great opportunity to get down there and beat those records. And that really is one of the most important parts of this whole thing. I will say compared to a internal combustion vehicle, so I've got an early Camaro with an LS motor in it, Love that car, it makes almost 700. Uh, would have been a blast to take down to do some, some land speed stuff with. I've also got a late model Corvette. Brian's got a Z06 Corvette. We love internal combustion stuff as well. So I don't want any of our fans thinking that Summit is 180 degrees now, all you're gonna do is EV and that's all we're gonna talk about. It's not. But EV is interesting, it's a new segment for us and it's something that we do need to learn about and hopefully along the way, we're gonna have you learn about that with us. So Brian, let's talk to, talk about what we learned. All right. Long trip. <laughs> okay, so the big deal is is we got this car and, and uh, the first thing we did is we plug it into a 110 outlet and the thing is picking up five miles of charge per hour. In other words, you leave it plugged in overnight 10 hours and you pick up a whole whopping 50 miles of charge. That wasn't working, so we ordered the 220 volt version, the 1450 NEMA, and now we're getting kind of a reasonable number where we can basically get to a full charge in, in 10 hours. However, going on these trips, there is an amazing number of different kind of 220 outlets. There's the one that is you know used by your dryer. There's the one on your welder. There's you know the one that you you know you will find in a KOA campground, which is another one. Uh, and by the way, you're going to find all of these adapters here at Summit Racing. We're going to have guides showing you like, here's what you're likely to run into at a KOA. Here's what you've got if you plug into your dryer socket. We've also got all the cool stuff. So in your garage at night, you know, you're not just running around with a huge extension cord that they've got reels and blah, blah, blah. So that is all part of our mission here is to learn about what we need to deal with the car on a daily basis and make sure that we have it in stock available to you uh, and for all of our associates to know all about this stuff. But the first thing we did is we basically planned the trip around the, the Tesla superchargers. Yeah, yeah. So what we did in Tesla's app is absolutely fantastic. You can go on and basically plan your trip and it will tell you where you need to stop along the way in order to charge the vehicle. And you have to be pretty strategic about those because every time you stop, if you've got a relatively low battery, it's going to take almost an hour to charge it. So we had a lunch stop, dinner stop, hotel night stops. We kind of planned the whole trip around trying to somewhat strategically do this. We did, however, learn in the very first leg of the trip that the, the claim that the Tesla will give you of about 280 miles on a full charge is not highly accurate. As a matter of fact, it's rather inaccurate. The best that we got was barely over 200 miles out of a full charge for our all-wheel drive performance Model 3. Uh, that also was, we, we tried a bunch of different things to get more miles out of it. 
Set the cruise control at 65. Turn, yeah, yeah. Put your hands out the window and try to wave the air by. Um, <laughs> put the air conditioning off. Turn every power accessory off in the vehicle. Run with the windows down. We did everything we could. We might have got like 220 out of it, but never at the 280. So you should be aware, as we found out, that we started in uh, Akron, Ohio. We drove down through Columbus into Cincinnati. We had to stop in Columbus in order to charge the vehicle. Stop, had an iced tea, hung out for a little bit, caught up on email, all that good stuff. Not really a huge deal, but it is an inconvenience. And it is something that whenever you plan a trip like this, you're gonna have to do. Before we drove uh, this vehicle on this trip, I was always pretty lukewarm about EVs, like, oh, I'm never gonna own one for a daily. Honestly, if I didn't have to do a long trip, and I do have family in Cincinnati, so traveling over 200 miles in one shot is important to me, if I didn't have that element, I would absolutely consider one for a daily. The thing is fast, the seats are incredibly comfortable. I mean, we did 1,600 miles in the car, and it was honestly a pretty easy, aside from the charging things, stopping to do that. It was really a pretty easy trip. Yeah, it, it really was, you know, and so, again, we, we Probably the last leg was kind of the toughest. Uh, we were down in, in uh, Catawba, Kentucky, actually. And from there going west over into Arkansas was a stretch. And yours truly made a wrong turn that and added 20 miles to the trip. I've never been more concerned about 20 miles. But we did get to stop in and visit with the good folks there at the, uh, the Blytheville uh, Fire Department. Hung out with those guys for a bit. Pulled into the track with a whopping five miles of range. We've never <laughs> been closer to breaking the car. Uh, but we've actually gotten pretty good at flat bedding the truck thing, you know, <laughs> since it won't go into that. Anyway, so we got out there, we plugged the car in. By the next morning, we were ready to run. Car was topped off. And each one of those runs down the mile, uh, or a little over the mile in this case, including the two mile return road, averaged about 16 miles of range per run. And, you know, really, you know, that's a full day of racing, you know, for land speed. You know, you're going to get in six, seven runs or whatever. And, that was fine and just, you know, went over there, the good folks, Steve over at the ECTA, had a 220-1450 uh, NEMA there for us and just plugged in at the end of the day, pulled the car out. But yeah, I mean, we had a good time and I thought that, you know, we, we did pretty well. And certainly we're here to share all this stuff with you guys. Yeah, as far as EV charging infrastructure, I would say that it was pretty complete until we got down to Arkansas. So on the way down, we stopped at how many different uh, locations? Uh, several. Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Columbus, Cincinnati, uh, Louisville, uh, Catawba, Kentucky, which was the last of the superchargers. And then finally uh, at the track there at Blytheville, where they did not have a supercharger, they had 220 out there. Yeah, everything with the track plug worked well. Uh, Steve with ECTA and your whole group, thank you so much for helping us with that. Uh, that made the trip absolutely doable. Had we not had that there, it would have been a little stressful because there is no supercharger anywhere near Blytheville, Arkansas. Yep. We would have had to go on, I think it was 75 miles away. We would have actually had to drop down into Memphis, which was an hour south. Uh, we did learn a little bit about Tesla charging stations when we were there. Uh, first of all, the Tesla superchargers are awesome. They work very well, but time of day changes the rate of charge because if there's a lot of electrical usage in the area, like at uh, say lunchtime for all the local businesses that are surrounding those chargers, it does slow the charger up a little bit. So that and was kind of interesting. And how many cars are actually charging at one time? If yes. you've got a typical bank of seven superchargers and there's seven cars trying to pull juice at the same time, that does slow things down. And it turns out that there can be just a mechanical issue with uh, some of the chargers. And we had one that was you know charging incredibly slow and we actually went and plugged into a different one problem solved, but yeah. who knew it until we did it. So I guess we should talk about the actual racing itself. Yeah, let's do that. So, so he had the first pass. Yeah, so the first pass. So I've driven this car in some autocrosses. I've done zero to 60 blasts in it. A little bit nervous at first. I'm like, okay, how's this four door family trucks they're gonna drive at you know, 140, 150, 160 miles an hour, whatever the case is. So we go out for our licensing pass, and if you attend an ECTA meet and you've never done it, like me, you've got to go out and do a half mile pass. They want you to maintain your speed, hit the brakes at the end to show that you know where you're at on the track and do all that type of stuff. So I went out and did it. Well, in the half mile, the car went 137 and a half. It's trucking. Yeah, that's fast. It was quite a bit faster than some other pretty much stock late model performance cars that were there. Um, it was quite respectable, and people were very surprised the car was that fast. 
So we went out, did the licensing runs, Brian and I came back, and then it was go time. Once you get your license and they sign you off and you're good to go, then we could go out and blast it. Well, we ran into an interesting thing. 136, I think, on the next pass at the half, a little bit slower because we had a little bit different wind at that time. And then we get to the mile, and my foot's in it, and it's just like parked at about 145 miles an hour, 146, maybe 147, and kind of bobbing around there. And Brian and I are scratching our head going, what is wrong with this? The next run, we run it out to the two kilometer mark, which <laughs> is, yeah, it, it's it's a farther distance. We're thinking, wow, maybe we're running into some aero issues or whatever, still can't figure it out. Well, it turns out we contact some of our friends through Tesla Trevor. owners online. Yep. Trevor, thank you for your help. And John and, Laughlin. Yes, and John Laughlin. And we found out that our model is the stealth model and it's so stealthy that it We did it was, not know that we had it. It, it, so it's great. So both Trevor and John, they're like, yeah, does your car have like the uh, the red line on the screen and, and, you know, Model 3 performance? Yeah, got that. Do you happen to have gray brake calipers? Yeah. Ah, yeah, you got the stealth version. Yeah, you the got lucky out, you got the unicorn. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, great, great, great. So at any rate, it didn't really matter for us, you know, 145, 162. It is what it is. Yeah. But it was a great learning experience for us. And we called up, you know, basically, you know, it, it's a nice community. Just want to say that to everybody, you know, that was, you know, assisting us out there. And, uh, you know, hey, we didn't break. No, we did not break anything. And the stealth Model 3, 145 is it. We actually... I think we hit 147 on one run, just so we had a little bit of favorable wind. But nonetheless, that is that is it for us. I will say it's speed. Um, you know, at 145, 147, whatever it was, I thought this drove respectably. You know, it's not not as good as a late model Corvette I have, obviously, because that car's got a lot of aero and all kinds of good stuff going on. For a four-door family sedan, not bad. It's not, not a bad, bad car. So we had the tow set up at zero because we do some autocross with the thing. We knew that we were going to be driving long distance. Uh, and we didn't want to wear out our tires. We got some nice rival S's on it right now. So zero toe. To, um, the way that the car is actually shaped, the underside of the car is completely smooth. It's amazing. And you know, to them, for them to allow air to go underneath by you know basically no split around it or anything like that. You know, they designed that into the car where it has you know air going over the top, air going underneath, no problem. At 80, 90, 100, at 145, it is not the most buttoned down car, but it wasn't bad either. You know, it's just no drama at all and we've made it really easy for you to go out there and beat our record too if you have any other model 3 performance basically brian let's talk about the cost comparison to a normal gas vehicle that is one aspect i found pretty interesting because we had debated that and we're wondering and it's like well we're going to do a 1600 mile trip we're going to have enough data to be able to do a pretty good average and figure out how, what is the real cost per mile so yeah so it's kind of interesting. We, we did keep very good logs. We took photos of, you know, the state of charge. Also tells you the temperature, you know, of the of the trip, you know, so it was 77 degrees, 82 degrees, it, you know, basically where we started, where we ended. So fairly detailed logs. Uh, I do feel like they were very accurate. I mean, we weren't going like 80 plus or anything like that. So they were, and neither are we doing 65 and getting run over by vehicles on the interstate. So what you would do if you're trying to get there uh, didn't run AC a lot, didn't run the heater, you know, so that's something else, but we kept detailed logs on it. And if you count the uh, uh, free uh, electricity that we got there at the track, the car averaged about uh, 40 miles to the gallon, the equivalent of a car that gets 40 miles to the gallon uh, at $2.84 a gallon or whatever, you know, 87 octane was. If you were like us where you actually had to pay for all of those things. We actually factored it in. It was closer to a 28 mile per gallon car, which isn't great because everybody thinks, oh, my Corolla gets 40. You don't have a car that runs 11 sevens in the quarter mile that gets 28 miles to the gallon. So that is something to think about. So is it your only car? Maybe not. But if you have a family with a couple of cars in the family and one's gas and you know, one's an EV, yeah, definitely consider it. Things are going to be changing real quick in the next five years. So I would say the long and the short of it, the ECTA trip was very successful. Uh, we made it there, we made it back, we charged it all the way along the trip, learned a lot about the infrastructure, uh, went fast, and now we have to do the next steps. We have a lot more racing we're going to do with the Tesla, more modifications, more ways we're going to race it, and we're going to try to keep doing that. And we're also going to keep working on all the internal combustion projects that we have. Because at Summer Racing, we're going to sell you parts no matter what you drive, whether it's EV or internal combustion. 
Thanks for watching. Yep. See you guys.